Welcome everyone. I am Vicky Murillo, the director of the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University, and I want to welcome all of you to this webinar on the political and economic consequences of the U.S. election for Latin America. We have the pleasure of having for this conversation two outstanding panelists, Shannon O'Neill and Mauricio Cárdenas. Before we start, just let me give you a little piece of information. First, we are recording this webinar, so by participating in it, we're assuming you're agreeing with the recording. And the recording is being shown live on Facebook, on the Facebook page of the ELAS. Uh, and it will be available as a recording in our ELAS webpage and YouTube uh, channel. The webinar will be run by me in the first half an hour, and we will be having a conversation. And then I will be taking questions from the audience from the Q&A. So please write your questions in the Q&A that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you're further interested in the impact of the US election on Latin America, I also want to invite you to listen to my last podcast episode with Julissa Reynoso, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Central America, Caribbean and Cuban Affairs, who just has been appointed Chief of Staff of the future First Lady, Jill Biden. Uh, so you can listen it in Unpack and Lat Unpacking Latin America on Spotify, SoundCloud, or iTunes. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Esteban Andrade for managing the technical aspects that make this webinar possible, as well as these two fantastic panelists who have generously given us their time and insights. Let me introduce them before they start with their opening remarks. Shannon O'Neill is the Vice President, Deputy Director of Studies and Nelson and David Rockefeller Senior Fellow for Latin American Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. She's a member of the Board of Directors of the Tinker Foundation as well. Shannon received her PhD at Harvard University and has taught at Columbia University and is an expert on Latin America, global trade, U.S.-Mexican relations, corruption, democracy, and immigration. She she's the author of Two Nations, Indivisible, Mexico, and the United States, and The Road Ahead, published by Oxford University Press. Mauricio Par Cárdenas is a visiting senior research scholar at the Center of Global Energy Policy at Columbia University at CIPA, where he leads research focused on energy and climate policy in Latin America. He's also a visiting professor at CIPA School of International and Public Affairs. Mauricio is Colombian and he's got his PhD from UC Berkeley and has a vast academic and policy making experience. He was the finance minister of Colombia between 2012 and 2018. And before he was minister of economic development, transportation, planning, mines and energy. He has also been the executive director of Teresa Rocho and the director of the Latin American Initiative at the Brookings Instituto, Institution. I have asked both of them to open with remarks on the economic and political consequences of this election for Latin America. And I want to welcome you both uh, and thank you for coming to this one. Who wants to go first? Channel, do you want to go first? Great, I'll start off. Um, thank you so much, Vicky and Mauricio. It's great to be here with you. Uh, and I'll just start off talking a little bit about how I see the shifts that will happen in US Latin American relations under a new Biden administration. Um, and, you know, I think one of the biggest shifts, political shifts, will be not just policy, but process. Uh, so we have seen four years of a US administration that's been very personal. Uh, it has at times been uh, somewhat punitive in its policy, and it has been largely transactional. Uh, and it has also been run out of the White House. So this is not an administration that has used, you know, what people call the interagency process, where you bring together all the different departments and agencies to have discussions about issues. It's really been guided by a very small team and sometimes just one or two people, often big decisions from within the White House. And so that way of doing things is going to change under a Biden administration. We're gonna see a return of bureaucrats, of experts, of specialists, of people who actually know the subject areas and who are you know, at their assistant secretary level or whichever part dealing with their counterparts on the other side and having a bit much bigger say in guiding policy. And so what that means is there can be more issues on the table because you're not dealing with just a couple of people for all of these different countries. Uh, and so I think we'll see a much broader 
uh, type of relationship, um, though it may move a little bit slower because you're going through and you're consulting people in all different parts of the US government, much less the governments of the other countries. And so we may see just a bit more of a plotting process um, than we have had at times uh, over the last four years where things sometimes changed with just a tweet. So I think that's sort of the biggest shift we're gonna see. Um, there are going to be differences in the issues on the table too. Some of the stuff is sort of always in US Latin America relations, obviously differs by country and in the particular bilateral relations. Um, but I do think Biden will have a, a number of priorities that are very different than what we've seen under the Trump administration. First and foremost will be the environment and climate change. This is going to be a guiding light for domestic policy in the US, but also for foreign policy and not just in Latin America, really, I think around the world. So um, as one can imagine, this might lead to some uh, tensions with certain governments. You know, Brazil comes to mind and some challenges over how um, the governments think about the Amazon and, and climate change and the like. In others, I think there will be opportunities to work together on this. But I do see this being an issue that permeates discussions of governance, of economics, uh, of social policies, and the like. We'll see climate change and environment be uh, a real guiding force where it has not been for many years. Uh, another issue you're going to see come to the forefront will be labor issues. Um, this will be uh, something given the larger democratic positions that we'll see. Um, it will be across the region. Uh, I think it will especially be for uh, Mexico, um, because the new USMCA, the replacement NAFTA, has a new labor clause that uh, has yet really to be deciphered or built upon. No one really knows how it's going to work yet. And so it'll be up to a new Biden administration and the new Congress to um, begin to use it and to utilize it. And I think there are a lot of people who are ready and willing uh, and building cases now or building sort of a back and forth that they will use. So I would be watching that. Um, with Mexico, but also broadly thinking about labor issues. Another issue I think we'll see come back onto the table where it's been sort of marginalized over the last four years are the issues of corruption uh, and anti-corruption issues. Um, this is something obviously that Latin Americans care a lot about. Um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we saw Peruvians come out in mass uh, uh, trying to defend or, or protesting uh, the removal of their president. Um, because of sort of back and forth charges of corruption and the people removing him seem to have as more charges against them than say the president who was on his way out. Um, but I do think this is something that you'll see broadly across embassies, across interests in the United States is an interest in this issue and helping reformers or getting involved in ways that would be constructive for more transparent and open governance. Um, and then in general, you know, I think the issue of democracy, of democratization, of how to make governments more responsive, accountable, uh, transparent, um, to reduce impunity, those kinds of things will be back on, in the talking points. And I, and I think actually in the policies as well, it's something that the government will care about. And so it's going to be, again, a very broad uh, agenda with lots of these countries in ways that we really haven't seen, uh, I would say, over the last four years. Um, and the last thing I would say is, while I do think that's going to be the agenda, what will be one of the challenges for a Biden administration is that the region in the last four years, I think has changed pretty dramatically and the issues facing the region have changed pretty dramatically. And so Biden and his team know the region quite well. He was the point person for the Obama administration on Latin America. He's visited many of these countries many times, um, but the region that he knew as a public official and is acting is not what it is today. It's a different place. And I'll just name a couple things to throw out there that we can have a bigger conversation about. So. Um, it is a region that is more, it's less democratic and more authoritarian than it was when he left office, when he was vice president. So you look at Freedom House data and many countries have fallen into the partly free category. Some countries, Venezuela and Nicaragua, have fallen into the not free category over these last four years. And so you're going to be working against this democratic erosion, sort of the rise of populists, um, the restrictions on the press, on civil society, uh, obstacles to uh, opposition political parties and the like within the electoral systems, that's something that is going to be different, um, or at least the magnitude will be different than the last time he was around. Uh, you're going to be dealing with a much more difficult economic environment than when he left, and I'm going to leave Mauricio to talk about that, but it is a very different place even before COVID uh, that, that I think the United States, as they engage with these countries, will have to deal with. Um, you're going to deal with a much greater stress 
uh, from migration. Um, and now Biden very well dealt with a big Central American movement back in 2014, but it's not just Central Americans that have moved around and continue to move around in the last four years. And really the huge uptick in Venezuelans throughout the hemisphere happened over this last four years. So that's something that the Trump administration has not grappled with. And I do think the United States needs to step in. So that will be on the table. And then I think some of the issues that he'll wanna bring back things like anti-corruption issues are gonna be a lot harder this time. Uh, and in part because the institutions that the United States had supported in the past, some of them are gone. Uh, so CISIG, the Guatemalan uh, institution that was UN backed, that's gone, it's been closed in there. Uh, MASIC, which was, was a OAS backed one that was for Honduras, that too has been shuttered earlier on this year. So some of the advances that we saw uh, on the corruption side and the, and the uh, cooperation we saw, for instance, between Brazilian prosecutors and judges and the Department of Justice uh, in the car wash uh, investigations and with Odebrecht and the like, those things are over somewhat discredited in some ways. And so I think it will be, it will be something that the US will want to bring back, but I think it's going to be harder to restart that agenda um, than many would hope. Um, so overall, you know, the, the mantra of the campaign for, for Biden has been build back better. Um, I do think he'll continue to use that both in the domestic space, but I think we'll see it also in the international realm. Uh, and for Latin America, the build back better in terms of the relationship um, will be the guiding light, but I think it's gonna, the fundamentals are much weaker um, than when he last left. So I think it's gonna be somewhat of a challenge for him and his team. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mauricio. Thank, Thank you, Shannon. Shannon. That was fabulous, Mauricio. Well, let me start by thanking also Vicky, you for this very kind invitation, very timely. I think this is the first event I've seen on what the Biden administration would mean for Latin America. I'm delighted to be with Shannon. Um, that I am sure I'll, I will agree with most of what she says um, because uh, I I, uh, I have followed you throughout the years and I always find that uh, your analysis of the region is, is quite spot on. Let me start by saying that I've seen a number of transitions throughout my life in US administrations. And I think the expectations before the actual change in government are always higher than the delivery. So let me start with that word of caution. Um, I was at the Brookings Institution in 08, 09, when there was the last change from a Republican to a Democrat administration. And um, many thought, many things were thought that would change. And uh, I think there is some inertia in the relationship between the US and Latin America. And I think that's gonna happen again. So just to moderate a bit the expectations. Having said that, I think there will be a very important change in tone, mainly because the Trump administration has used a very negative agenda in its relationship with Latin America. It's been about illegal migration, building a wall. It's been about drugs. That's mostly the relationship uh, with Colombia. And it's, it's been about something that is very unique to the Trump administration, which is to use the threat of trade sanctions. The idea that if you don't do this, we're gonna renegotiate your trade agreement. And remember that many countries in Latin America have free trade agreements with the United States. And I think they spent the last four years fearing that one day there will, there will be a tweet saying, next week we'll start renegotiating the FTA with Peru, with Chile, with Colombia, with Central America. So that tone is going to change. And also not just because of the new administration, a new party, but also because of the new circumstances. We're in a crisis. The world is in a crisis. And that, in my view, will basically define the context in which these relationships will evolve, at least in the beginning of the Biden administration. So the themes are going to be the global themes. It's going to be fighting the pandemic, fighting the recession, fighting climate change, and also delivering on some of the promises that President-elect Biden made during the campaign that have to do with, um, with immigration and beginning with the dreamers. So 
that is a very positive agenda. And I think it's very different from what we had in the last four years. So that change in tone, I think creates some optimism. Let me say what I, what I don't think is gonna change, at least in the, in the short to medium term. I don't think the relationship in regards to Cuba and Venezuela is going to have major changes. And not necessarily because there is no interest in changing that, I think it's more the political pragmatism that will limit those changes. In four years, the Democrats will want to win the White House again, and they wanna make sure that they win Florida. And uh, they lost Florida essentially because of votes of the Cuban Americans, the Venezuelan Americans, the Colombian Americans. And those votes are votes that are very different from other Hispanics in the United States. Those votes are voting for what they perceive is the US policy vis-a-vis -vis their countries of origin. Um, and, uh, and in that case, it's, it's about making sure that socialism in South America and in other parts of the region doesn't expand. So that's the concern. So that vote will basically make sure that there will be no change in the short run relative to, for example, to, um, to politics related to uh, the initial opening that there was with Cuba. And I will think no more, no tolerance towards the Maduro regime. I think in the case of Venezuela, probably the changes will come as a result of the way the US is going to re-engage with Europe, which I expect that to happen. That is a very, very important element of the foreign policy of the new administration. And through that new coalition with Europe, seek a diplomatic change uh, um, in, uh, in Venezuela. Let me finish these initial remarks with what you wanted to hear most from me, which is the economic issues. So one of the key issues here is the recovery post COVID and the capacity of Latin American countries to have adequate financing for that recovery. I think in that area, the new US administration will introduce changes. I am under the impression that, for example, this conversation that has been taking place over the last year about the possibility of the IMF issuing a new wave of special drawing rights, SDRs, which is essentially printing money so that the member countries of the IMF have access to that pool of funds, um, will probably move forward. If you read, for example, the letter that Larry Sommer sent hypothetically to the new secretary of the treasury, that's one of the things that he recommends. And that will benefit Latin America as will benefit the world at large. And there will be also the issue of the Inter-American Development Bank under its new management. It's been most mentioned, especially by the new president of the IDB, the need of a capital increase at the Inter-American Development Bank. That of course will face hurdles especially from the US Treasury, which I'm sure will look at the alternatives, where to put the resources for foreign aid, and probably look at Africa and look at South Asia. But that's going to be a, an important theme. I don't think necessarily for 2021, maybe 2022, I think the, the IDB has enough capital to continue its lending at the current level for one more year, but then it's going to be a big theme in the relationship with Latin America. And I think President Biden will have a lot of pressure from his uh, counterparts in the region to make sure that the IDB is adequately capitalized. So I don't think we'll see that soon, but we'll see that uh, once the administration has settled and once um, the more uh, pressing issues in the domestic agenda are dealt with. So I'll stop there and uh, happy to take your questions and comments, Vicky. Thanks, Mauricio. That was fantastic. Both of you were great. So let me start with a question for Shannon that you might take in and the other, and then I will get to a question to you. And uh, to the audience, please write your questions in the Q&A and in the second part, in the second half of the hour, I will be taking questions. So Shannon, you have written recently a, a piece about the implications uh, for Mexico of a change in the administration. 
uh, suggesting that Trump has been very nice to Lopez Obrador and only ask him to close the border, but otherwise doing whatever Lopez Obrador wanted, more or less, I'm ex exaggerating. But it does seem that way, given that uh, just two days ago, a Mexican general who was a former defense minister in charge of a drug cartel who was in prison in the United States for this reason was returned, you know, was returned to Mexico with the charges dropped by the U.S. State Department, by the U.S. Uh, Justice Department. Um, and you just mentioned also in your remarks that labor was also going to be an important part of the agenda. So how do you see in particular for Mexico, which is so tied to the United States, uh, the relationship under a Biden administration? Sure. Um... Well, you know, I think some of the things I was talking about are going to be a really big change for Mexico. And Mexico, of all the Latin American countries, has been most guided out of the White House, right? The relationship uh, first before this administration in the previous Peña Nieto administration, the um, finance minister, Luis Videgaray, was very close with Jared Kushner uh, during the campaign, Trump's campaign, and then later on when he was president. So they policy was made between the two of them. And then once we had a new administration, AMLO administration come in, uh, the foreign minister, uh, Marcelo Ebrard, sort of took that, that position and the two of them really made the policies between the two countries uh, across the board. Um, and so uh, that I, is going to change, right? You're going to have all the different departments. I mean, with the relationship between the United States and Mexico is so rich and, and broad. Um, that there are literally dozens of different departments and agencies that are involved in Mexico. Many have representatives in the Mexican embassy in, in Mexico City um, and, and look for their counterparts and look to do policy. And a lot of that process has been stopped or at least slowed over these last four years. And so I think you're going to see a revival of that. So that means, you know, assistant secretaries talking to subsecretarios in their particular areas to hash out details of commerce or agricultural policy or water policy or environmental air policies or, or border issues or customs forms or all sorts of things. So that return um, to, you know, institutional normal in many ways, I think is going to be good for um, the relationship, um, but there are going to be challenges. Um, one of the challenges is going to be just capacity. Uh, one of the things on the Mexican side. So one of the things that AMLO has done, Lopez Obrador, the president has done over the last two years is reduce the size of the bureaucracy of the civil service. Uh, and also, you know, put in measures that really weeded out a lot of the technically oriented folks or people who had a long history there. So he put, passed a law, for instance, that says if you're a public servant and when you retire, uh, you cannot work in an area, a conflict of interest for you to work in an area that touches on your expertise for 10 years. So that basically means only people, this is their last job, or you need to leave the government if you want to work somewhere else. So you've seen really an outflow of folks. Um, so one, the Americans are gonna have a hard time finding partners and, and people to work with on the other side. So I think there's gonna be some tension there so, and just capacity. Um, the other tension is going to be that I think a lot of the issues the United States wants to put on the table, Mexico's not really interested in and particularly Lopez Obrador is not interested in. Um, you know, it's, it's surprising to me in many ways, but as far as I can tell in Mauricio, you're the energy expert, so I'll defer to you. But as far as I can tell, Mexico is the only, or at least one of the only countries around the world um, that is trying to return their energy matrix back to an intensive fossil fuel matrix, right? Saudi Arabia is trying to move into solar, all these other countries that are big producers, we'll leave Venezuela aside here because I'm not sure what they're trying to do with their system, but, uh, but Mexico- I, I, yeah. let, me inter let me tell you, I thought you were gonna say that Mexico is the only country that could comply with the OPEC quota by doing <laughs> nothing because they just lost that, they lost that production. So they couldn't produce it. Well, well, that too, but 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 working to move back into a much dirtier future energy matrix for the country. Uh, you know, they're they're investing in you know refineries. They're investing in all kinds of production. They're cutting back and canceling uh, renewable energy contracts. They're kicking out international companies that do wind and solar. They're moving in a direction that the rest of the world is is not. Um, and, and it's puzzling to me. But that is going to be. Obviously, with the Biden's uh, concentration and, and interest in environment, that's going to be a, a real area of um, difficulty, I would say. Um, and then I think we're going to see real difficulties on areas of governance, everything from anti-corruption 
um, to sort of democratic checks and balances and freedom of elections and, and those sorts of things. I mean, I, that is something that, um, you know, the sort of the role of civil society, the role of the free press, um, AMLO has not been uh, particularly friendly, let's say, to the press, um, to independent civil society organizations or social movements such as the feminist movement in Mexico. And so I think you will see from a Biden administration a more vocal ambassador, um, whomever that person may be, or, or um, administrative people in Washington when they're dealing with Mexico, caring a lot about those issues. So I think there are gonna be these areas of tension, but in the end, I think it will be much better for US-Mexico relations to move beyond just, um, one, just migration and tariffs, um, and to move beyond this sort of more punitive, uh, threat-based way of interacting with each other. Oh, Vicky, you're on, you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry, there's construction, so I'm trying to reduce the noise. Um, so that's a good segue in the, to the question I had for, for Mauricio, which is really this issue of the new agenda to fight climate change and to curb carbon emissions and, and to transition into a different energy matrix that's more based into renewable sources. And so given your expertise in the area, I, I would really like to hear What's your view on this, not just with regards to Mexico and Lopez Obrador, and in which I agree with Shannon's reading of that administration, but also the other large country in the region and economy in the region that has not recognized uh, Biden's victory yet, which is uh, Brazil and the presence of Bolsonaro. I mean, that's also a president that's not particularly big on, uh, on policies of energy renewal and, and climate change and so on and so forth. And, and, and even during the campaign, in, in one of the debates, uh, Biden mentioned Brazil and the Amazon and even hinted at sanctions uh, to deforestation. So what's your view on, on what will be the future Biden administration policy towards Latin America in this crucial area of his agenda? Sure. Let me begin by connecting where Shannon just ended, which is Mexico. I think we're going to see, as part of that reapproachment between the United States and Mexico, we're going to see a most, much more engaged U.S. administration in making sure that the contracts that were signed during the Peña Nieto administration with many American firms to implement projects in the renewable sector, wind, solar energy, new pipelines, are actually completed because there's been a lot of discussion in Mexico that the executive branch, President Lopez Obrador, is getting involved with the regulation to derail those projects. So many American investors whom actually recently sent a letter uh, to President Trump through their senators and, and congressmen and congresswomen will find more echo to their concerns with Biden. So in that more, the, the, the soft diplomacy between Mexico and the United States, I think is going to touch on that to try to move that agenda again. And that will be good for the Mexicans, by the way, because Mexico for the last couple of years during the Lopez Obrador administration has been pushing uh, back on these issues of renewables and going back to a fully focused agenda on the energy sector on oil, essentially. So that's good. The Everyone should read because it's quite interesting and very comprehensive Biden's plan on energy. I think it's, uh, it's really amazing what the US administration wants to do. Let's hope they, they, if they achieve just half of what is there, it's going to be remarkable because it's going to be about technology. It's going to be about research, innovation that will, in, without any doubt, spill over to the rest of the, re the world, not just to Latin America. It's going to be beneficial for everyone because it's going to be access to better technologies, uh, cheaper renewable energy. And I think Latin America can benefit tremendously from that. Vicky, you mentioned the case of Brazil and the Brazil-US relationship is a, is a very complex one historically. But I think what's going to be different is not so much in terms of the development of alternative energy, renewable energy, in which Brazil, by the way, is quite good. And th that hasn't changed. Brazil has a very aggressive agenda in terms of developing 
um, unconventional uh, renewable sources of energy. It's, it's the leader in Latin America without any doubt. But the more contested issue is, is the preservation of the Amazon. And the more, I think, the issue that will be creating the tension is going to be that one. That was already uh, in, in the air in terms of the relationship between some of the European countries and Brazil. I think uh, uh, the US is going to be an amplifier. It's going to make, it's going to echo a lot of the concerns that the Europeans have uh, regarding the way the Amazon is being handled, handled by the Bolsonaro administration. And broadly speaking, in the region as a whole, I think the, um, the idea that uh, Latin America can become, including some countries in the Caribbean, can become an important source of energy and especially renewable energy, um, it's going to be a, a key force. It's something that the region needs. It's something that will provide some economic opportunities for Latin America. And uh, US companies with their capital, with their technologies uh, can play a very important role in this new phase. So I think this is, a, this is gonna be a very active element of the engagement between Latin America and the United States in the years to come. Thank you. I have my last question for the two of you, and then I'm going to start taking questions for the Q&A. And this is about the relationship between the US and China. So this is, you know, certainly one of the biggest challenges of a Biden administration. It has been crucial for the prior administration. During the Obama era, it seems that the strategy was containment, the DPP that the United States drop out of it, looking for allies in the Pacific. There's a high dependence on global commodity chains that are based in China. And yet in China, it's an important partner. It's actually the main trading partner of many nations in South America in particular. Uh, it's also an important investor in many nations in, in natural resources. It's also an important creditor of a few countries such as Ecuador, Argentina, and Venezuela. So certainly China has its footprint in the region. And it seems that whatever it does might affect the policies of the United States on labor, on trade, on relationships towards the region. So how do you see this, this rivalry between the US and China affecting the relationship between the United States and the region? And do you think there's any country or group of countries that may be particularly affected by this? Sanon, do you want to take it first and then Mauricio? Sure. Um, well, you know what's interesting is, is the animosity or the hostility between the United States and China, um, that I don't see changing with the change in administration. I mean, you look at the Congress, this is, there's a bipartisan wariness towards China. Now, different people believe that you should deal with it in different ways. I don't think the Biden administration will do it with punitive tariffs, and that won't be the approach. But I do think this overall understanding, and not just on the economic side, but the national security side, that there are some threats to the United States and to its system uh, from China. Um, you know, there's technology threats, um, there's worries about espionage and those sorts of things. So I think we are going to see an ongoing tension as we go forward. So that, you know, setting the, the groundwork for that and then what does that mean for Latin America? Um, you know, the other thing that I do think we will see, and this does pertain at least to some countries in the Western hemisphere is, you know, if you look, Biden has a whole supply chain platform right, how he's going to deal with this. And China's a big part of that. And a lot of that is uh, pretty forward leaning for the US government. So there's a lot of Buy American clauses. There's a, a lot of um, wanting to use um, what they call the DPA, the Defense Production Act, which is sort of the US ability to buy capacity or go out and buy lots of contracts to get people to make stuff here in the United States. Um, now, lots of countries are talking about this in, say, health products, you know, uh, protective equipment or ventilators or other things as, because of COVID. Um, but I think you're going to see a real expansion there of rare earth minerals, of other kinds of commodities and the like. And, you know, I think one of the areas you could see cooperation with Latin America is um, not just by American, but could it be by Western Hemisphere, right? And so the easiest there is to look to U.S. neighbors, right? Could it be sort of by North American, right? If you're trying to bring rare earths away from China, 
Um, does it have to be in Minnesota or could it also be in Jalisco or could it be in, in Manitoba, right? Could it be somewhere within your allies uh, rather than having to be at home? And there's lots of benefits to uh, bringing things not just geographically concentrated, but but some sort of diversity. Um, and so, you know, NAFTA or USMCA is a good place to start, but but the United States has free trade agreements with lots of countries in the region. And so I think there are allies there, you know, perhaps you could see sort of a Western hemisphere move as, as they encourage strategic sectors and particularly sectors that are strategic for what are deemed national security concerns for the United States. Some of that could come back to uh, the, the hemisphere more broadly. Um, and, and so you could see some allies forming uh, in making sure strategic goods are available to, to everyone. So I think that's one area where you might see some advantage. Um, in terms of China's involvement and how the United States may react to that, you know, I think you're already starting to see this and I don't expect this to change uh, with the Biden administration and worried about Chinese technology and particularly Chinese technological infrastructure forming the base of various countries. So Brazil next year is gonna auction its 5G. Is Huawei gonna play a big part of that and are they gonna win it? That's gonna be a big concern I think for the Biden administration. Um, and it, frankly, it may be a concern uh, given that at one change, change in tone, I totally agree with, with Marizio on that, um, but another change is actually looking for allies again. So um, we've seen divides between Europe and uh, the United States on a lot of issues in, in the last four years. Um, but you've started to see European countries, the UK let off, uh, taking Huawei out of their systems. If you had the Europeans and the United States worried about sort of these technological infrastructure, um, it wouldn't just be the United States telling Brazil not to be it. It might also be uh, the, you know, the European countries as well. So how, you may see some divvying up of the technological world, um, and in Latin America, would not be, might not be, um, you know, it might be one of those cases where Latin America is on the table rather than having a seat at the table, right? So the Europeans and the United States say you have to choose one, and then the Latin American countries and governments may be in a tough position uh, deciding which way they go. Do they end up in a, you know, China Asia focused world, or do they end up in one that is more focused on the Atlantic Ocean side of things? So, um, so I think there are going to be challenges there. You know, one last thing I would say is, you know, what's been interesting is as much as you've seen a lot of um, rhetoric and vitriol between the United States and China and Trump uh, and, and China, it really hasn't carried over into Latin America. Um, yes, you've seen a little bit on Huawei, but other than that, um, it's it hasn't, it was not part of the policy really, right? That we did not see a lot of um, bravado nor real policy to try to keep China out of uh, Latin America, except some passing references here and there, but it wasn't a concerted policy. So um, if anything, I think we may continue that, but it, or it may become a little bit more systematic, which is back to sort of institutionalizing the relationship, but a little bit more systematic with a US interest vis-a-vis -vis China in the region. Alicia? So you want me to add a few words? I subscribe to what Shannon said, and uh, let me let me just reiterate that uh, I don't think that with the change in U.S. administration, there'll be a significant change in the U.S.-China relationship. I think that relationship is going to be con is going to continue to be characterized by tension, rivalry, and of course, um, it's going to be about protecting U.S. jobs, protecting U.S. corporations. Uh, it's going to be about reshoring, bringing back some of those activities that um, uh, that uh, left the United States and went to to China. And I think there's another argument now for that, which is uh, national security. The idea that some of the items that China produces, especially the health products, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, health technologies, all of that now is very clear that the United States wants to make sure that there is no supply shortages, or at least that uh, there is no disruption in the supply chains uh, in the future. So all those arguments, I, I would go even beyond saying that they are bipartisan. They're kind of like national. It's, it's, it's now in the DNA of the United States. So that's gonna happen. I guess the quick question is, what's the implication of that for Latin America? And I think here, um, policy would make a difference because if nothing is done, there'll be some reshoring. Um, the um, there'll be more, you know, trade negotiations between the U.S. and China. 
that will restrict some of those um, imports from China, but nothing will happen to Latin America. To really make sure that some of those uh, activities are relocalized to Latin America, what they call now the near shoring, um, that, it, that will require key interventions. That will require uh, decisive action on the part of the US administration. I don't know if that's gonna happen. Uh, the IDB is talking a lot about that. Uh, the Financial the Development Corporation, uh, a new entity of the US administration is uh, basically saying the same thing. But that will require financing the private sector to build these factories, plants, to uh, make sure they produce these services in Latin America. It has to be deliberate. It's not gonna be spontaneous. I don't know if the Biden administration is going to engage into that. That will require an extra effort. It will be fantastic for Latin America if that happens, but I don't think it's assured. A lot, a lot will have to happen before we see that um, in reality. The other element, and with this I'll finish, is Chinese investment and Chinese lending to Latin America. Is the US going to discourage that? Um, I think this is going to, this, at the end of the day, this is going to be the key argument uh, for increasing the capital of the IDB. Uh, Congress in the United States is going to be receptive to the idea that unless the IDB is capitalized, the lending and the influence that comes with the lending to Latin America will come from China, not from Washington. And I think that argument is going to be very powerful in making sure that the IDB has more capital. At a time when it's going to be uh, difficult to raise capital for the international financial institutions because there'll be pressures from everywhere in terms of additional expenditures. But then my question is, uh, with the tensions with China, between the US and China, will it will then result in something positive for Latin America? I, to me, there's a big question mark around that, uh, around that issue. Thank you, Mauricio. And I'm going to take one of the questions that leads to you and also add an aspect that I think Fanon could talk about. So the, the question is, what are your insights about the macroeconomic situation of the United States and how it's going to affect Latin American countries? So, and this is both in terms of the demand, you know, uh, of products. I'm thinking also in terms of financing, if you think of Wall Street and the competition that the treasury is for financing around the world. Uh, and here, I, I really want to emphasize the, the trade integration, especially of Mexico and Central America no. with, uh, with the United States. And so you could think of these macroeconomic conditions as also be drivers of migration flows. So I wanted Shannon maybe to speak at I that lost, aspect. I lost you momentarily. Oh, that I wanted to say, you know, what is the macroeconomic condition of the US? Yeah, how is that going that. to affect the region? And to Shannon, how is that going to affect migration flows in particular from Mexico and Central America that are so tied to the United States? So Let me you give you a... Let me give you a quick answer uh, because my, uh, the question for Shannon is harder, but let me give you a, key, a quick answer. The, the US economy is doing remarkably well, relative speaking, uh, given the pandemic and given what's happening in the world at large. Um, I think the US economy will do even better because uh, very soon there'll be a very significant stimulus package. So we're gonna see the US economy growing at healthy rates and that will have a spillover effect over Latin America. And I think that's the first message that the Biden administration will tell Latin America. There will be more cars being produced in Mexico. Um, and eventually, commodity prices will go up again. Goldman Sachs just put out a report saying that they expect a new oil boom. Can you believe this? That oil prices could go up to $65 per barrel next year, based on the fact that people have more cash because they're getting the transfers from the government, not just in the US, but everywhere in the world, especially Europe. Um, and that creates more demand for energy and that there will be an increase in commodity prices, which will be very good news for Latin America. So the spillover effects of the recovery in the United States are certainly something that will be very welcome uh, in the region. I think that will be the first item in which the Biden administration will concentrate. Okay. Um, no, I agree. And, and I think the United States, um, you know, I think we're headed for some uh, dark months ahead, both uh, physically and metaphorically, but but there are vaccines on the way. And, and once we get to that again, I think the United States economy has a real resilience and and we'll see a, an impressive growth. Um, that said, 
on the migration issue, I actually do think the next six to eight months is going to be pretty dire um, for the United States and for and and a huge uptick in migration. In fact, I think this could be one of the first domestic crises of the of the Biden administration is a flood of people at the U.S. southern border. Um, there's a few issues, few reasons for this. So. You know, one is um, just the economic devastation of COVID, right? It's hit Mexico, it's hit Central America, it's, it's been incredibly difficult. Um, two is that you have seen uh, increasingly dire consequences from climate change, many of them, um, but particularly in Central America, right? You've seen droughts, you've just seen two hurricanes just back to back. Um, displacing 400, 500,000 people. So a lot of people are already on the move. And the idea is, would they keep on moving? Um, you still have difficult levels of violence. You still have, um, you know, weak governments. You still have all those other kinds of reasons why people left in the first place. And you've started to see caravans moving um, for for all that mixture of reasons. Uh, and then I also think you will have um, people thinking with a change in government, you no longer have such a punitive uh, uh, rhetoric coming from the White House on migrants, and you have a bunch of uh, coyotes, right? The people bringing uh, migrants up who are saying, now's your moment to come, right? They've been out of business or they, their business has been quite slow for several months. And so now they're trying to make money. And so moving people is the way that they're going to do that. So I think we are going to see a movement. In fact, actually, since April, the numbers of Central Americans and Mexicans arriving at the southern border has been increasing. And this last month in October, they're back up to rates of summer 2019, which was sort of a high point. So, um, or at least in recent, recent years, high point. So I think that is going to be really a huge challenge for the new administration. Um, and one where the migration system, the migration court system, um, all of that has really been, has deteriorated under the Trump administration. So I think it's going to be um, both the domestic teams are going to be working on that, but then also the foreign policy teams. And, you know, what we likely see rolled out over a couple of months is one, how do you keep people at the border in a more humane way than has been in the past, right? We're not going to see kids in cages. That's not going to happen again, but how do you manage those flows? Um, but then two, how do you put back in some of the structures that you saw in 2014 by the Obama administration, where if you want to apply for asylum from Honduras, there's actually a place in Honduras you go to apply to asylum. You don't have to go all the way through Mexico to get to the southern border to do so. So I think we're gonna. That's going to be, um, frankly, one of the biggest challenges, uh, domestic and international, for the new administration, until this economic stimulus and and growth kicks back in and that filters down. Okay, there's a bunch of questions that are in countries we have not touched upon. So I'm going to uh, mention some of them and you tell me who wants to take them. So uh, we talk about Brazil, but there's a question on Argentina. How are they going to agree with the IMF? They seem to insist on isolationism and hoping that China could provide investment. And so I guess the US is an important player and Argentina was benefited by the good relationship it had with the US in the prior administration in getting access to the IMF fund. So in general, Mauricio argued the IMF is going to play a good role, but maybe you can say something about Argentina. Then uh, there is, a, you mentioned Guatemala and Honduras and the, and the situation of people coming here and you mentioned that democracy and human rights will be more important, Shannon. But somebody asked here, would the Biden administration have recognized Juan Orlando Hernandez's re-election in 2017 with all of the fraud accusations? Would Biden even cut military and police aid to Honduras? So how that would play? And then I'll, I'll come to other countries that are on the list. If I could say, if, if, may I speak first? This, well, if, sure. I, if I could say just one quick thing about the two questions, Argentina and, and Central America, especially countries that have been more adversely hit by the, the hurricane season. Argentina. Argentina has had a good relationship with the IMF. I mean, the IMF has been flexible, adaptable, um, has extended um, its, um, its uh, agreement and uh, has given Argentina time to um, get its act together. I think what's remarkable about Argentina in a negative way is how uh, uh, devastating the pandemic has been. It's kind of like the outlier in the region. Um, and that, uh, that helps me connect with an issue that has to do with the Biden administration. 
uh, we haven't talked too much about uh, multilateralism, but I think uh, the, the one phrase that President Biden will not pronounce is America first. He's going to be more engaged uh, with the world in general, with the idea of the global public good. And that to me means helping the world through the WHO figure out a way to get out of the pandemic, including, for example, the supply of the vaccine. This idea that the vaccine will come first to the United States and will not go every, anywhere else unless it's been, uh, it's been uh, administrated uh, to everyone in the United States, I don't think that's a, that's a reasonable approach. And I think Argentina can benefit a lot from that multilateral attitude towards health. Same concept applies to Central America. What we're seeing in Central America is these two hurricanes, you know, back to back, uh, ETA and and uh, and uh, IOTA, uh, basically uh, telling us climate change is having devastating effects, and that reflects, as Shannon said, in migration. People that are coming to the United States are coming because they're being pushed by the lack of access to their land. They cannot uh, produce in the agricultural sector. Um, they um, uh, basically their farms are being destructed. So climate change is a key issue. So I sincerely hope that uh, one of the first decisions we're gonna see is uh, the US back into COP21, the Paris Accord, uh, President Biden pushing not just for the compliance with the Paris Accord, but especially with the concept of net zero, net zero emissions by 2050, it's in the energy plan. Uh, and that, of course, will have an impact on other parts of the world, including Latin America, but I'm sure also is going to be motivated by the fact that the U.S. is behind these agreements. So uh, that will have an impact, a positive impact on the part of, of the region that has been most impacted by climate change, and that is particularly Central America. Yeah, on, uh, Vicky, I'll, I'll leave to you the Argentine politics about whether... Uh... <laughs> whether the government can come together and find a find an agreement with the IMF that the rest of the world can can uh, you know sign on to, I think the United States is open to that. But um, but the track record on how it went with the private sector investments, at least in the markets, doesn't look so good. So we'll see how they can go in the in the quasi multilateral markets, right? <laughs> Um, you know, in Honduras, it's interesting. I will say that when, um, well, one thing that we saw under the Trump administration was both CISIG, which was the Guatemalan anti-corruption investigatory body, and then MASE, which was the Honduran one, were both uh, killed by the, or, you know, were shuttered by their respective governments. Um, some that those investigatory bodies were actually investigating at the time. And there was not a lot of pushback from the White House. Um, there was an attempt by Democrats in Congress at the time to save them and sort of rally the, the faithful or rally the international community to protect them. And it, as minor, as minority party in the two houses at the time, it was, or it was ultimately unsuccessful. But I do think we will see much more interest um, by a Biden administration and through the State Department and, and other parts in in those kinds of bodies, right? In building up the kind of checks and balances and accountability mechanisms and autonomous agencies and things that can try to hold, um, you know, abusive or, or, or corrupt power to account. Um, I, it's hard for me to imagine, uh, you know, a, a President Biden or, or anyone in his administrations wanting to uh, shake hands or invite to the White House um, someone who has you know, allegations of drug trafficking against them in US courts and by the Department of Justice, um, that, that seems to me a bit far-fetched. So I, that I doubt in terms of uh, you know, Honduran's leadership, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. And as you think about how do, you, how do you improve Central America? How do you make life better there for people? So when they're making their individual decision whether to stay or to go, more of them decide that they can stay, that that's an option. And you know, you need good leadership to do that. And unfortunately, Honduras is a country that does not have that at this moment. Thank you, Shannon. And we will have the summit of the Americas next year in the US. So that, that hypothesis will be tested. Um, there's tons of questions on Venezuela. And I know Mauricio already said uh, that he doesn't expect any policy change. Um, but in general, I think you also you also said that you know there's lots of migrants from Venezuela, and 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 President elect Biden had promised TP, uh, you know TPS to to them, so they would now have an even a stronger incentive to try to come to the United States, and there's tons of Venezuelans in Latin America. 
So uh, I understand Florida, but this might also cause another domestic problem unless there is some change in Venezuela. I think Cuba is less of a problem now at this point, but Venezuela might be a potential big domestic issue. So I don't know if Shannon, you wanna say something or Maurice, you wanna? Yeah, I mean, I do think we will not see, I don't think we'll see a significant change on many of the building blocks of Venezuelan policy, right? I don't think you're gonna see sanctions lifted on, on various people who have behaved badly from Venezuela. Um, I don't think you're going to see investigations into money laundering things. Those are those will continue and, and even maybe perhaps even double down on those things. Um, the, you know, the Trump administration after a while backed away from this idea of military intervention. That's not going to happen under a Biden administration nor any U.S. administration, frankly. Um, but we'll probably not pretend that it's going to happen. You won't see the pres vice president or president-elect Biden saying sort of everything's on the table when it's when it's really not. Um, as Maddie already said, I think you will see. Uh, efforts to rebuild a coalition around Venezuela and, and look for more diplomatic support and, and cohesion, right? The Lima group had fallen apart and are there countries that you can pull back into that? The Europeans can play a role. I think you'll see some of that, but the big one will be, I, I do think the United States will engage on the migration side. And so, you know, the Trump administration for all of the, you know, um, bravado that you saw in Southern Florida about, you know, defending against socialism and all of that, they were deporting Venezuelans back to Venezuela from the United States during all of that time. So that's going to stop. Um, and I do think that you will see TPS for people who are here and for some that, that have ties and the like. So you will see that temporary protective status that we saw in Central America in the 1990s in the face of hurricanes, as well as other um, political reasons. Um, so, so, you know, I think that will be, so you will see more Venezuelans coming into the United States. I think that's true. You're going to see asylum more broadly open up. Some of that will help Latin America. Some of that will come from people all over the world. We've had so few people come in with asylum uh, cases um, in the last, especially the last couple of years. So I think that will be broader. I also think you will see there'll be more receptivity to trying to deal with the humanitarian crisis. Um, both in Venezuela, but then also in um, countries like Colombia and others that have taken so many people. So I think there'll be more engagement and, and forward leaning on that than we have seen, um, because there are five plus million people who are, who are moving around the hemisphere. I could just add a word about that. I think that's the, and it, it's uh, paradoxical that we left that for the very end. I think that's Latin America's number one problem today. And I very much hope that the Biden administration um, is conscious and aware about that and uh, makes efforts to bring a solution. It's not just uh, about the Venezuelan people, which we all know very clearly is a, a, are under a very dire situation, but it's also about the millions of Venezuelans that are outside their country, including 2 million uh, in my own country here in Colombia. So that's, it's, it's, it's really the most pressing issue. And uh, the hopes are that uh, there'll be a negotiated diplomatic solution because the, the change needs to take place. Um, Maduro needs to leave. Um, and, um, and Venezuela needs also uh, to, uh, uh, to make sure that there is a new uh, uh, democracy. But, uh, but that won't happen if we continue doing what we're doing now. I think that will require uh, very skillful negotiations, including uh, the key partners here. And that is uh, the US, China, and uh, I think Russia and China will also need to be uh, on the table. But um, I think that's the, the, the main test for the Biden administration in terms of uh, resolving one of the big um, international conflicts and issues of our time. I, I sincerely hope that uh, uh, it's given the priority it needs. Let me uh, finish with a question that I think is pretty crucial for the last two decades of the region and for the state of the region. And so this, this question is about, it asks, do you expect any changes in US policy towards drugs in Latin America? And certainly the war on drugs have, you know, marked, has been a high mark of US policy towards the region, towards Colombia, towards Mexico. Um, and it doesn't seem to have worked very well. You know, the region has the highest homicide rates in the world and violence has only increased. Uh, and at the same time, in this election and in subsequent elections, we have seen the liberalization of domestic consumption of drugs in the United States. So it seems kind of 
uh, schizophrenic in a sense. So uh, I will rephrase, I guess, Marcelo Bergman's question. So do you see any changes in the policy towards drug uh, trafficking organizations in the region from the United States besides the return of the general <laughs> to Mexico? I, well, I can start with that. Um, you know, I think we will see uh, sort of a return as, as the framing of it to citizen security versus just going after drug traffickers. That doesn't mean that it, you stop going after drug traffickers. So, you know, they're still looking for, at, you know, TCOs, as they call them, trans, uh, cr transnational criminal organizations and, and looking at their finances and looking at their structures and how do you sort of take those down. I think those things continue. Um, you know, I think the the fight against some of these illegal substances is changing, one, because it's legalizing or decriminalizing in many areas. So I think there's a conversation to be had internationally about what that means. Um, in the hemisphere in particular, it's also changing because the nature of drugs is changing, right? And so plant-based drugs are less, uh, less important in the mix vis-a-vis um, -vis synthetic drugs. And those synthetic drugs come from different places, right? Lots of the precursors come from China. So that's part of the drug trafficking routes are now uh, across the Pacific, not just sort of North and South um, as we go forward. So I think there are conversations that will happen, um, but, you know, the violence, and you know, the one thing I do come back to um, at being in a lot of these conversations, and in fact, I'm just finishing up a bipartisan US congressional sort of task force that I'm part of that looks at Western, he Western Hemisphere drug policy um, and, you know, on the sort of violence side, one thing that always strikes me is, you know, the United States has more drugs and it has more money in drugs because here's where the profits are when you go from sort of wholesale to retail than any nation in the hemisphere. But we don't have the violence of the, you know, the challenges of a Mexico or a Colombia or Brazil or other places. So I think it, yes, drugs are a big part of it, but that's not the whole story um, because there's more money and there's, there's more supply up here. There's more money up here, but we don't have the violence. So I think those two issues in many ways need to be dealt with in different ways than, um, than the shorthand often says. If I could just say a word about that from the perspective of Colombia. Um, the Obama administration was involved and participated in the peace negotiations of Colombia, and they were very supportive and embraced the peace agreement. Um, Secretary Kerry at the time was here in Colombia in the signing ceremony. Um, I think that, that that is a very important point because uh, the peace agreement in Colombia has as, as one of its key components, um, a change in the policy towards uh, drugs, especially um, a commitment on the part of the government to bring alternative crops and alternative development to um, coca producers. And that requires resources. It requires a, a significant engagement on not just the national entities, but also uh, international, uh, like UN. So to me, that is a very important element to reduce uh, coca production in Colombia. And uh, President Trump in the final months, especially as the campaign was heating up and trying to conquer that uh, Venezuelan, Colombian, Cuban American vote, um, had very strong language against uh, the peace agreement and against the policy that Colombia had adopted vis-a-vis uh, -vis drugs. So my view is that this will give support to a potential solution to the problem, which is essentially alternative development. Where I also see change is in US domestic policies vis-a-vis -vis the drug criminalization. I think one of the topics, and we heard that over and over during the campaign debates, the presidential debates, was the fact that uh, the US prison system was overcrowded. And uh, to me, that means that there is interest in some changes in the criminal code to make sure that some of these offenses are not necessarily uh, punished by um, um, jail sentences. So my, my view is that it will, that will have an impact, but more on the domestic um, um, US policies related to um, the way this uh, has been criminalized in the past. 
Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you, Shannon. I'm, I'm really thankful to you for, you know, a fantastic uh, conversation and the answering to, to all the responses I had the time to ask. I'm, I'm sorry for those of you whose questions I didn't get to, but there were more than 200 people that attend the webinar. So I want to, again, thank everyone, the audience, the two fantastic panelists, and ask you uh, if you're interested in uh, attending other events to follow the Institute of Latin American Stud Studies on Twitter, on Instagram, and Facebook. I am Vicky Murillo, the director of the Labs, and I really want to thank everyone for a fantastic webinar. Thanks so much, Vicky. Thanks, Marisa. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Ciao.